Welcome. It's a real honor to have our guest uh, here today, Ksenia Pavlovich. She is the founder and editor-in-chief and White House correspondent for the independent American media platform, The Pavlovich Today. She is a political scientist, an author, and an uncompromising advocate for the freedom of the press. Uh, and that was epitomized uh, this past year when she made international headlines uh, for breaking the White House's uh, brief camera ban uh, by live streaming uh, the, one of their briefings, uh, an audio uh, streaming of the briefing via the Periscope app. And this was a transformative act, um, a revolutionary act, and the, the White House then uh, re uh, changed their policy back to uh, uh, allowing uh, audio and video back in the, in the briefings. Um, Ms. Pavlovich has a, a, a historical connection with Yale University. She was a graduate student here, I believe graduating in 2014, if I understand correctly. And while here as a teaching fellow, she taught courses such as The Hero in the Ancient Near East. She also taught up at the Divinity School, a course on American Christianity. Uh, and she assisted Professor Ian Shapiro in creating the online version of his Moral Foundations of Politics course that's currently up and running. Um, she has been a senior instructor in the Yale Young Global Scholars Program. I should mention that that is a program that is ongoing and that Pearson has hosted uh, in the past and will be hosting this summer as well. It's a wonderful program. And Fausto uh, was a participant in that program as a high school student, correct? Yeah. Um, and uh, Ms. Pavlovich has led a wide range of seminars in politics, law, economics, international affairs, and security. And uh, she's a native, native of Serbia and has a personal history that's made, had a deep imprint on her career path. And, her, um, and so that's one of the questions I'm, I'm really excited to ask her about today. Will you please join me in welcoming Ms. Pavlovich to Pearson College. <laughs> Thank I'm so you. glad that you're here. Thank you. I, I'm really glad to be here. And yeah. thank you, Stephen, for this wonderful introduction. And Absolutely. thank you, everyone, really, for taking time in your busy schedules to come here and hear me talk and uh, participate in this very important discourse we are going to have on uh, press freedoms in Trump's America. Mm. And uh, I also would like to say thank you to the Pointer uh, mm. Fellowship thank Initiative yeah. here, Journalism Initiative here at Yale who is also supporting our talk today, which I find to be very meaningful in a very difficult times for our profession. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad to be back at Yale and um, in a way uh, give back to the community uh, that gave me so much mm -hmm. in my um, intellectual, uh, ac in the acquisition of my intellectual capital, let's, let's say that way. I want to echo my gratefulness to the Pointer uh, Fellowship. Um, we have partnered with them in the past, and they are really instrumental in bringing some r remarkable guests, including our guest today, to campus. And it's a real uh, wonderful uh, gift to this the university um, that they, they create time and time again. Um, as I said, I want to ask you a question about your own personal background. And I know that you grew up under the dictatorship of Milosevic. Yes. And, um, and so you had a, a very interesting journey uh, to the, the the point of your career today, could you talk a little, kind of guide us through your life and 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 how you came to be a journalist and why you value this work so deeply? Sure. Well, this is also a self reflection mm. for me as well, and and having this opportunity to talk to you because for the first time also I'm here as a guest to the environment that I called my home. Mm. So in a way, I can now look at my life from um, perspective of a viewer, mm. which while you are doing your life journey, you cannot do, so, do it so well mm. because there is no time because you're so driven to arrive to your destination. Mm. Mm. Because if even for one moment you stop <coughs> and uh, try to make sense of what you're doing, maybe you can get scared, <laughs> especially in, in uh, the life circumstances um, I was born into. Mm. And that was not my choice. And it was something that was basically given to me mm. by mm. my own birth, by my own nationality, by my own family. And um, I came from the environment, from a dictatorship environment in which 
this climb towards freedom was a very difficult one, psychologically first and foremost, a very difficult one. Mm. And I like sometimes to think that uh, the survival skills I have acquired for the past, let's say, at least three decades, more than three decades, mm. uh, were as hard as um, army you know, rangers training mm. in terms of survival skills because you're living in an environment where you don't, ha you don't have food, you don't have electricity, you don't have hot running water. And for most part of your life, at least your formative uh, years, you do not get to reflect on that in a sense to complain. Mm. Because if you start complaining, then you're going to understand how difficult that is. Mm. And that can break you. And that is something that um, I, I, I believe that I acquire mm. the survival mm. skill but also uh, that very early in my, um, in my childhood even, I was aware of the value of human freedoms. Mm. And this is what I like to say uh, today when you're here in America and even mm. you know, here at Yale University, which is a <coughs> uh, really wonderful um, environment, uh, environment of freedom, that we should never take our freedoms for granted. Mm because there were all the generations of people who went before us and who did this hard work that we enjoy today. And when you grow up in an environment when you do not have that, mm -hmm. then I believe you value it even more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I was growing up that, and that's very different from, for instance, your generation here, especially here at Yale University, because my essential life question was how to make departure mm. while while you're growing up in this environment you're thinking how to make your life in this country how mm. to mm. make how to make your life success in this country and uh, my formative years were about how can i flee how can i depart mm. how can i make my move to for, what for me was a stronghold of hope and that was america and mm. that didn't come overnight it was decades and decades mm. <laughs> you know in, in in the making but to go back to your initial question which is political question right i um i was part of a generation who who was going to the protests all the time mm. and i remember uh and i shared some notes uh, my mm. personal notes with you prior to this conversation mm. Um, from the political memoir I'm working right now on, um, I went to the first mass protest against Milosevic. That was about the freedom of speech and against the mm. state-controlled media mm. Mm. in Serbia. And that was extremely dangerous because uh, we had the police fire of the tear gas at the protestants. Um, they were beating the crowds. It was very dangerous. And I was a 10 years old, 10 year old uh, mm. child. And people asked me, but why, why your mother would take you to that protest? <laughs> but the reason why she took me there, because this was the first massive protest, but the moment when we arrived there, no one knew that it's going to be a massive protest. Mm. It was not to, supposed to be a massive protest because uh, there was no enough media at mm. that time to send back the message to the people that this is possible. Mm. Mm. So that was the first experience I had as a very young um, girl. Uh, very first experience I had where I really learned that you need to stand up for freedom of mm. the press when you have only one state control channel, mm. uh, you need to do something. And I don't want to be too you know, religious in a way, but <laughs> you're a religious scholar, so I want to bring this in to this conversation. But you know, in, in biblical terms, they say, ask and you shall receive. Mm. But I think that works for the countries that are already uh, having the, the rule of law. Mm. But I think in Serbia at that time, and that was Yugoslavia, mm. it was something like, 
ask and then force the door open to <laughs> receive. Yeah. Uh, it, it is yeah. like that because I I felt that um, the experience I was having uh, back then mm. were driven to force the freedom in. Mm. You could not just decide one day that you want to live free. You need to fight for it. And so many journalists were fighting with, with their lives. And that was something that really defined me in terms of um, knowing very early what it means to make a moral choice in politics. And how early on did you know that you wanted to be a journalist in particular? Um, I studied journalism, but uh, I always loved writing. Mm -hmm. But uh, we only had the University of Political Science mm -hmm. in, uh, in Belgrade. I grew up in Belgrade, the capital of Yugoslavia. And I always wanted to be involved in, um, in politics, in writing, but the only way to do it, and that's a very interesting question, in fact, uh, you, could, you, need, you needed to go to a uh, university of political science that was run and operated by the establishment. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting that through my um, undergraduate days at the uh, University of Belgrade, the whole journalism depart department was anti-establishment. So I also had that uh, mm -hmm. in my experience where um, very famous journalists of that time were doing resignations because they were not agreeing with the dean. Mm -hmm. And I learned what it means that you can resign with, n with knowing that you're not going to have your salary, right, right. but that you're going to uphold your principles about doing the right thing. So I think I, I, I realized that very early. Mm -hmm. But I think the, the first practice that I went to, it was my mom that told me uh, afterwards, today you learned what it means to stand for what you believe in. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the role of a witness in history is to write and witness what he or she has seen so the history cannot be forged. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I think I was lucky that I have, have in my family um, my parents who never belonged to the party of Milosevic mm -hmm. and who were, you know, okay that we are not never going to be rich, mm -hmm. but we're going to be rich in, in our education, in our spirit, in our understanding of the world. And I never had this pressure in my family that I need to belong to herd mentality. Mm. And that was very difficult because here you can do whatever you want. Mm. You can vote, not vote. This is still America, right? Mm. But uh, in, in former Yugoslavia at that time, it was very difficult to do anything in life without belonging to the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I wanna, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to open it up uh, for all of you to, to jump in. Um, and I want to flash forward and ask you to engage in a little bit of cultural analysis. Okay. Um, and drawing on the background that you've just described and also drawing on your professional experience as a journalist, as a White House correspondent in particular. Today, yes. Today, right. So we live in a, in a rather tensive environment in terms of the way that the government <laughs> and the press are interrelating. Mm -hmm. Uh, gave the example of, of your active resistance. I wonder if you could, but I, I was wondering if you could reflect a little more broadly on um, the challenges that you face as a journalist in this environment, or maybe that we all face in, in a certain respect as a society, uh, and kind of lead us through what what that aspect of your professional life, what sort of insights you draw from that. It is today, right. Yeah. Um, Christopher Hitchens, like Christopher Kitchens, who is really one of my role models. Mm. When he went to interview Borges, uh, Borges uh, quoted this wonderful um, verse to him, mm -hmm. uh, originally r written by uh, Edmund uh, Blunden, mm -hmm. an English poet. And it goes like this, and why I'm saying this you will understand. Mm -hmm. It says, um, this is my country, and it might be yet, but something came between us and the sun. And I think that's a great opening for what's going on today, because when we were talking about the challenges for a journalism profession, it is the Donald J. Trump who is now standing between us and the sun. And um, I'm using a metaphor, um, <laughs> but uh, I think that is the good way to start unpacking the problems that are going on today in, uh, in America. 
as a journalist specifically, uh, we work in extremely hostile environment. Uh, we work in an environment where the leader of the free world doesn't understand what it means to be a journalist. He doesn't understand the role of journalism. He doesn't understand uh, the First Amendment in its foundational principles because the Founding Fathers, they put First Amendment for a reason in the Bill of Rights. He understand, He thinks that journalism is there to be his publicity machine. And that's not the role of the journalism because we are the fourth state. We are there to serve the public and to hold the government accountable, but he lacks that understanding. And everyone asked me why I took a stand first as an independent reporter, <coughs> as the founder of an independent media and news outlet. And for me, and drawing back on my experience, is that when a political leader stop listening to Vox Populi, when he is asking us journalists to oblige to the government that is working against the public access to information, and in this case, the access to the White House briefing, which is extremely a special room for every freedom lover in the world. When he does that, it is the journalists who need to defend the moral choice in politics. And that for me was a moral choice in politics. Mm -hmm. And why I believed was so empowering is because my example is showing that you do not need to be a multi-million dollar news corporation you can make a difference. You can bear to voice your opinion. Because I believe it is in this country that no one should be afraid to voice their opinions, to make a political stand peacefully, of course, not in terms of you know doing something illegal, but in terms of freedom of expression. If you cannot do this here in America, where can we do it? And um, that, that is something that I feel is the biggest challenge because um, he's proclaiming the journalist the enemy of the state. Mm. And I'm not so sure if he understands what he's doing. Mm. That's the biggest puzzle for me. Does he understand that he is not a reality star anymore, that he is the president of this country? And that with that comes enormous responsibility because the world is watching at you mm. and what you're saying. And if he can make such statements, what is to stop other di dictators in the world from doing the same? Mm. Because we are so caught up on this news cycle that in all honesty is so exhausting so toxic that the journalists, that my colleagues in the White House briefing room, we often talk <laughs> and, and we say, we, we just want one day without any news. Mm. Just, to <laughs> <laughs> just to go and, and rest. <laughs> it, it is really like that. Mm. And there is so much that the public doesn't know because you're not in that room. But we are in that room every single day, dealing with toxicity on every single level. You're dealing with incompetence. Um, and I, you know, the biggest challenge I, I find is that he is changing the texture of what it means to live the American dream. And I will tell you why. I think that because you ask for a cultural mm -hmm. assessment is because American dream was always about merit. Yes, you can achieve whatever you want, but you need to earn it. Mm. It has to come with merit. And with the way Donald Trump is hiring people and dealing with political decision, that's really not the idea of the president mm. and meritocracy that usually people have in mind when they think about the American dream. 
So that, that I think it's very interesting to, to look at because you have reality stars now, like Omarosa, for instance, she's fired now. But you have reality stars making political decisions that are supposed to change lives of people without any competence whatsoever. And I'm not saying that you can only do one thing in life because I'm doing many things in my life, but at least you need to know something about the subject. Because I believe that politics, despite all its limitations, still has the power to change the lives of, of the people for the better. And that should produce the, the highest possible good. Mm -hmm. And with that comes responsibility, and uh, he, he doesn't understand that. So I imagine that these topics uh, prompt questions. Uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts, questions that you might have for our guest. I have a question actually goes back a bit. Uh, under Tito, at least is what I know, there were no mass protests. In fact, the motto, and you'll know it in Serbia, I, I don't know it, which is essentially, uh, we are Tito and Tito is us. I don't know if you could, for everybody else, if you remember uh, what that was. I remember, I was a pioneer. Yeah, okay, Wait, so you uh, know the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah so, I know. Uh, <laughs> what was the difference in, in public or private mentality? You talk about politics being moral choice in the Tito uh, era versus Milosevic, the difference between a communist dictatorship and how you describe it. But how did that change from which an era in which they're young pioneers, and we're all trained to believe that Tito is us and we are Tito. Uh, it's hard to believe that was the slogan, but that's what it was. Uh, I remember seeing in bold lights over the square the first time I went to Belgrade to Milosevic. What happened to there might be protests then when there, there obviously weren't when I went there in the 60s and 70s? Nationalism happened, and this disintegration in Yugoslavia happened, and that was the catalyst for political violence that erupted. And um, during Tito's time, he was capable to keep all these communities together under the umbrella of Yugoslav identity. But then you had nationalism popping up. Mm. And uh, I think uh, when you have such a strong populism popping up in, in, in uh, while the country is uh, disintegrating, that lots of bad things happen. And then people, I think, unleash their identities and they want to change because they were not happy with, with, uh, with the system. That, I think, was the reason uh, why the opposition happened in, uh, in Belgrade. Uh, during Milosevic, and why did they dare to protest? I think maybe because um, it was the right thing to do, because maybe the country, maybe they were able to look what's going on in other countries. Mm. I, I'm really not sure what the answer is, but I remember that in my family, that was just like an oxygen mm. to go to the protest. and. Uh, People didn't want to be exposed to propaganda anymore. Hmm. It started with the media. This is how it started. The first massive protest in former Yugoslavia, in Belgrade, in Serbia, uh, in March 1991. That was a protest for free press. It was not the protest per, per se against Milosevic. It didn't start as re rebellious act against Milosevic. He started as a um, protest against the, the national television. And then it just went from there because he sent the tanks, military tanks on the streets. Mm -hmm. And then uh, young people like yourself today, they were this driver of the change. Mm. And you ask me a fantastic question, but I'm not so sure, you know, even for myself, I have an answer to that. You just dared. It was not even a question 
whether you should do something or not do something. You just wanted to live free. That was uh, how I felt it, how my generation did it. We didn't go to classes. We went to streets to protest. And I remember at 8 o'clock, and this is how it started, because they were giving this propaganda on evening news at 8 p.m. Every single day, people were going, uh, opening the windows, and they were taking like pens and pots. And they were, you know, drumming the pens and pots in protest for the whole duration of the evening uh, news edition. Mm. So it didn't happen overnight. It was a gradual 10 year long protest that culminated in the spectacular uh, bombing of Belgrade. And then uh, finally we were able to vote him out of the office with, it was October 5th, 2000 that no one really knew how it's going to pan out because they were he was uh, making orders for the paramilitary units to go on the streets and kill the protesters so it was a gradual movement towards uh, freedom and democracy democratic project I imagine in the White House briefing room and other venues, you rub shoulders with representatives, if I may call them that, of Fox News and other Trump outlets. Do you have any sense of how those people really feel about what's going on? <laughs> are they true believers or are they, you know, doing it just for the, the money or what's in their minds to the extent that you know, know them personally? Well, definitely Breibert is a believer. I, I, I would think that they are believers. I think uh, Cernovich, Cernovich, how you pronounce his name, Mike Cernovich, who comes from <coughs> um, I think he, he is also of Yugoslav origin. Mm -hmm. His family, I think. Uh, he's also a believer. Alex Jones is a believer. Um, Fox News, in my view, is, uh, if I'm free to say, right now, a government propaganda channel. Mm. That's how I see it. You, you, you got to believe in this stuff in a way to be able to advocate it in, in, in a sense they, they are doing. I would not be able to do it. But whether they're believers, they're doing it for money, or maybe it's a combination of all these incentives, it's very difficult to know motivations of, of people. But I would think that you have to believe in nonsense in order to promote it. What is the nature of your relationship with other journalistic colleagues? Is it, I imagine, some mix of uh, collegiality, competitiveness? How does that play out on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you have people that you hang out with? Uh, do you have people you tend to like get into little scuffles with, or you know, how does that? It's what interesting like? because when I, when I came first to the White House briefing room, there was a veteran reporter, I cannot say his name, mm -hmm. but he's very famous. And he told me, Miss Pavlovic, you're now in a shark tank. <laughs> Make a, f no, he said, find a few friends. No, no, not, he didn't even use the, the word friend. He said, find a few people you can trust. Make the waves but only when you're sure that your boat can make it to the other side. Huh. Interesting, no? Very collegial. <laughs> In and, a certain way. Yeah, right? I mean, there he, are people... He doesn't want you to sink. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or maybe he doesn't want me to make the waves. Maybe, yeah, uh, that's true. If I, I'm not sure if, yeah. if I'm going to arrive on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So it is a mix. Yeah. If I really want to be honest here, it's, it's extremely competitive work environment i and i'm a high achiever uh but this level of uh, competitiveness i don't think that i have ever experienced in my life just being in that room is the life experience in itself there are people who are going to be very honest and supportive of you but the problem with with the environment is that every single person is competing for what you're competing for mm -hmm. And then many, especially among the young people who are coming in, you know, new reporters, 
they are doing this in order to get a transfer to something better. Mm. So you have this chain, um, professional chain, that everyone wants to climb up in order to achieve something. But for me, that's different because I already come as an owner of my own media. So mm. I do not have this kind of uh, right. ambition. Mm. Um, so, but there are people who, who are going to really be there for you. It happens. Mm. I have a very nice relationship with a few of, uh, of correspondents and I feel I can trust them. But what, uh, what you don't know is that we do not talk about anything inside of that room. You have to go outside. Yeah. We always go outside. And that was the, 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 some of the things they told me when I came. Do not make any comments inside. But, but yeah. you know, I'm yeah, thinking, yeah. you know, if, if really they want to know what I think, they know it already. <laughs> so it, it's difficult to hide. But um, I asked you to do a cultural analysis of uh, the, effectively the administration and that situation. It, if you turn the glass the other way, I mean, how do you, I mean, this may be difficult because the journalistic profession is a variegated landscape, right? But um, how do you think journalists as an institution are holding up their end of the bargain? Are they, do you feel like collectively uh, you and your colleagues are rising to the occasion? Or do you sometimes, do you come away disappointed sometimes at, at what, what you observe amongst those sharing the same task? It's a great question. And I'm just trying to... For instance, when it in the situation, in the example of the broadcast ban, mm -hmm. I felt that we did not raise to the occasion mm -hmm. as a group. Mm -hmm. That's how I feel. You kind of felt on an island a little bit, like on your own. Because I feel we were tiptoeing around something that we were not supposed to tiptoe around. Hmm. And why is that? There are many reasons why. One is, you know, access. You want access. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be banned from the White House. You work for a corporate media that has so many stakeholders. They, are, they tend to make more conservative decisions. Mm -hmm. But at that moment, I felt that we were sliding into complacent surrender hmm. where you're in a situation where you're where you're saying okay fine no problem <coughs> when we all knew <coughs> when all <coughs> america knew that our role was to say no hmm. and to make a stand and i and i would like to see more solidarity in that sense among our profession mm -hmm. to be less about the networks but more about the profession, because I believe that every journalist who set on a journey to, to write about history and be so close at the source, because we get the news before you get the news. Mm. That, that's kind of proximity we, we have in the White House Press Corps. Uh, when you set on a journey like that, you want to do it for the right reasons. You, you want to do it as a service. And I believe that corporate networks are too much taking from that, away from that role. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because there is a contract, there are advertisers, corporations. Mm. And in my personal view, I believe that corporations do not care about the individual voice. They care about ratings. And this is why I like academia, because here, you can exercise your autonomous thinking, your autonomous decision making. You decide what topic you want to focus on, mm -hmm. what to give your priority to. So journalism can learn a little bit more now, I believe, from the university settings. Because I believe that right now in America, universities are the freest intellectuals intellectual spaces. Mm. It's more fast up. So over the past year and a half, the term fake news has come to the spotlight. It's certainly being tweeted very often. 
And how is this concept of fake news changing the way journalists approach their task? Has it had positive impacts at all, or is it really just an attack on journalism? From the perspective of the president, you mean? Or from our perspective, or both? From, from your perspective. Well, the whole term fake news was invented by the president, and it's a punchline for him. Like, it, as it was his punchline, you're fired. So he's now using his fake news every single time he dislikes the news. And that is a problem. So how to, is this a problem? It is a problem. Because someone, you have a president of the United States undermining the trust in the media. And he's sitting in the office of great power. He's not a private citizen. So he has this huge responsibility, and he's not upholding that responsibility. So when a leader of the free world tells you your fake news, that, in my view, is a problem. And it goes against the American values as to what our political leadership should be about and what has always been about in the history of, of, of this nation. Fake news I heard from dictators when I was growing up. When, when the president would ask for a firing of a journalist, when he would ordering, you know, for some journalists to be regime uh, removed. Uh, I remember when I was watching the news edition, when the presenter would list the names of, of journalists who are now the enemies of the state. But mm -hmm. this is all in a broader context of fake news mm -hmm. because they want you to believe that this is all propaganda. Mm -hmm. And then he's all the time praising Fox News as this was his own publicity machine. And these people at Fox News, they do not question anything. It's just like this blind consensus as to anything what he says. So in that sense, it's, it's dangerous. How we re perceive this as, as journalists, as people who are working on this, we know, we know the meaning of that. We know it's a, it's a tough question because how, how we can, how we can resolve this problem? That is the biggest maybe like a larger issue here. And you do this by increasing the competency in the newsroom. And the way your fra question is framed, I think it's very also telling what, what he's doing, that he's always pitting one side against the other. Mm -hmm. And then you are have like this screaming match, basically a crossfire, where all you see and hear is the noise, but there is no substance potential analysis, there are no implications, there is no solution given. It is about your fake news and you're doing a great job. Am I hearing correctly that one of the consequences of this, these, these uh, rhetorical attacks, is amongst you and your colleagues is a kind of greater sense of burden to raise your game? In other words, that there's a tangible effect on the pressure you feel to somehow uh, continually attain a quality of, of product. You have to. Yeah. You have to. Yeah. You need. You need to stand up to that. Yeah. Because this is serious. It and why is it dangerous? Because it became a punchline. And why is it dangerous is because he's capable to serve these all labels and punchlines to the nation with the measure of entertainment. And because it's so entertaining, mm -hmm. I believe it's very dangerous. Because if a political leader is, I just want to finish this yeah, because sure. I think it's very important, because if a political leader 
is serving you abuse on a daily basis in a very open way, you're going to push back automatically, right? Mm -hmm. Even in a life, real life situation, if bully tries to punch you in the face, you're going to try to push him back. Mm -hmm. But when someone is serving you the views and uh, analyses and conceptions that he has about the news through very entertaining uh, packages, that, that is, this is when the audience is becoming more uh, acceptive of it. Next one right here. Um, so you mentioned entertainment, and then you also mentioned, or we've talked about kind of the journalists feeling this increased duty to um, put out good content to, to maybe counter what you think is propaganda. And I was wondering where you think social media played a role in that. Um, if you think that, or I don't know, like as a journalist, how do you feel social media has affected um, our ability to receive like good analysis and, and has it exacerbated that entertainment value of news over maybe, um, I don't know, the useful information that we need in order to make choices as citizens? Definitely. Because when you are supposed to say something very smart in uh, 140 characters, now they increase the characters, but <laughs> if you are supposed and asked to deliver the information, to deli deliver substance, to deliver solutions in a very you know, limited um, tweet, then of course that social media is responsible. When uh, we, as the media, are reacting to every tweet he makes, even at 11 p.m., then we are also taking uh, responsibility in contributing to that. Because not everything he does is newsworthy in a sense that increases the knowledge, the understanding. Um, sometimes I think that the coverage we are producing about the president fits the mandate of the TMZ rather than uh, any serious political journalism. And for me, it's even more difficult because I'm a political scientist. So I, I studied politics and I have a little bit deeper understanding of the world and the social sciences and how you ask a good question. And, and then I see the discourse you're having, and I'm not pleased with what I see because it's not such a good quality of, of discourse because we do not hear any explanations. We do not hear any solutions. And no one is telling us how to change that. And I believe the youth is the future. And this is why my, my own platform is uh, dedicated to helping young people um, engage and uh, be creators of the ideas and solutions and the news instead of being a consumer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's quite a novel uh, approach because everyone is treating your generation as a generation of consumers. So everyone is trying to subscribe you for something. But I would like to see our generation as, as the leader of a change that is going to say, okay, what I think matters, I have ideas that matter, I want to have a say, what kind of future we are going to create because I am, I mean you, you are going to be the leader and the holder of that future. And we need to think about the footprint for humanity that we want to leave. Um, because I think that's, that's the future of journalism, that's the future of political leadership. Call it even the new political design, but we need to start caring about moral leadership, uh, humanity, solidarity, in a, in a good way, in a forward-looking way, progressive way. Not progressive in terms of political parties, but progressive in terms of creating progress for our humanity. That's, that's for me, it's a crucial uh, issue, especially uh, with my experience, as I lived through extremely difficult times, 
and I know what it means that you have a precancerous cells in a society mm. that can lead you to mm. to the limitation of freedoms. Mm. Someone in the back has their hand up. Yeah. So my question is regarding just sort of the your conception of what it means to be a journalist and how that definition is changing, especially because, like, in terms of international protection, like, a journalist is just considered a civilian. I mean, I guess it's narrowed in terms of whether they're involved with the military or not, but especially with the other question in terms of, like, how social media is impacting sort of the immediacy of journalism, like, how do you think that definition of what it means to be a journalist has changed and how should it change with the changing times? As a journalist, you need to, to serve the public. Journalism is probably the only place where you can be free, that you can exercise freely your intellectual faculty, and you need to uphold the truth and ethics. And I'm going to go back to the moral choice uh, journalists always need to defend the, the moral choice in politics and to hold the political leaders accountable. I do not like this trend uh, where the IT people are now overtaking journalism. Facebook is overtaking journalism. Twitter is o overtaking journalism. That, in my view, is a problem. I don't like it because I was reading today uh, student publications here at Yale. And honestly, I was impressed how good the content is in these publications. Why do we not see more of that in our media landscape? So to go back to your question, what it means to be a journalist? I understand you, you want to be a journalist or you're a journalist. <laughs> I try, yeah. But <laughs> okay. So I think what it means to be a journalist is wherever you decide. To be and if there is one you know lesson I think I know for sure in life is that you can become whoever you want by many ways you can do you can do it with this group of people or that group of people it's up to you but you need always to know that you what you're doing is good for you and it speaks to you to your own integrity to your own values so before knowing what it means to be a journalist, I believe you need to know who you are, what it means to be you, what it means what it means to be a decent human being. Let, let's talk about that, because I feel we don't have that anymore in our political uh, system right now, in our political landscape. Let's do this return to humanity and basic human decency and morality and ethics and just do the good thing, do the right thing. Whether you're a journalist or you're a banker or you're a professor or you're a peer person, I don't know, but it needs to come from you. And I I think this is why all these uh, studies here at Yale, directed studies, uh, grand strategy program, all these kind of classes are also shaping you as a human being. We have a course that's being offered this semester called, what is it, Psychology and the Good Life, <laughs> which has attracted over 1,200 students. So I, I, think, I think they're voting with you on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here. Um, given the threats to journalism that we see today from social media, from people receiving their news from other sources, um, from suppression, uh, what steps do you think journalism will have to take to survive as an art form in the future, if any? To survive in, in what sense? In to, to continue to reach the audience in a way that is um, effective, informative, and doesn't compromise um, journalistic values and integrity? It's a great question. I think we should not be focused so much on the form, because journalism right now is so much concerned about technology, how you deliver the news, how you distribute the news, but it has a very little to do with the content creation. 
and uh, everything now needs to be sound bite ready. And even if you invite a scholar to talk on his or her area of expertise, the media is expecting this person to deliver everything in already ready-made sound bites. It needs to be, you know, very distilled, on point, and politics is complex. So the future of journalism has to be about substance and has to be about longer forms, I believe. Hmm. I was going to ask you, uh, what are the news outlets or, or sources that you most like to go to? Outside of your own, obviously. In other words, where do you see that that vision that you're talking about? Whether long form or the kind of the the kinds of uh, journalism that captures the complexity of the issues involved. Where do you what what places do you think do that well right now? Perhaps C-SPAN okay. is the one that is allowing at least some panels and larger conversations, and they're filming. Um, talks at universities. I, I honestly don't see it any, any, in any other news channel right now. Okay, so that's, that's a video. What about, uh, what about written forms of media? What, what uh, are there specific places you go? They're doing a real, th th that's good stuff. That's good stuff? Yeah. I'm eclectic. Okay. I like to read <coughs> some things in Washington Post. Mm -hmm. I like to read some writers in New Yorker. Mm -hmm. I like to read uh, things in New York Times. Mm -hmm. Basically, big legacy media. Mm -hmm. uh, specific, foreign affairs. Do you have specific writers that you, whenever you see a byline, you're like, yes. I, I think I, the, my like, favorite writer is dead, so. <laughs> 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 that's not, kind not of as disappointing. No, but that, you know, <coughs> I, when I interviewed also Martin Amis, he, hmm. I asked him, a similar question, and he said, all my role models are dead, unfortunately. <laughs> and I thought that was funny, but now I'm, I'm becoming this person that I can say the same. Um, I, I, my really real role model is Christopher Hitchens, because he was so bold. And there are ideas yeah. about, he had ideas that I absolutely disagree with, but he had this intellectual boldness and mm. this courage mm. to speak his mind. And I do not see that uh, mm. a lot at the level that he was capable to, mm -hmm. to really strike this intellectual uh, conversation. Uh, mm. So I, I don't have a better answer. No, it's fine. No, it's good. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I, I wanted to know, <clears throat> what's the nature of the uh, government in Serbia today, and how are the you know, people there reacting to, to Donald Trump? In, you know, people in Serbia and uh, the, the government in Serbia. Oh, they love Donald Trump. Really? Yeah. Hmm. They love Donald Trump, but that's, you need to understand that uh, Serbia has this history of dictatorship, so they would probably love Donald Trump and leaders like that. Um, it is... Um, Who's the leader now? Uh, Vucic. Alexander Vucic, he is the president. He was a former prime minister. And um, he was one of the people my generation was fighting against. Mm -hmm. So that is why I, you know, I always think... People are talking right now how they're going to vote out Donald J. Trump from, from his office. But that's not that easy. Because you can vote someone out from the office, but what you really want to vote out are regressive political ideas. So it's not about the individual. It is about the ideas. And these ideas have some very strange way of showing up resurfacing in the history, especially with, uh, in countries uh, with uh, repressive uh, past. Mm. Even if you look what's going on in the Middle East with this is Islamist movements, terrorist movements, um, they had these 
intervals when they show up and they go basically underground and they so you need to treat problems uh, at its very source and how you do that by educating people and inviting everyone to be an active citizen inviting everyone to be a fierce critic with arguments never personal never be personal that i think uh, is because you asked me before about the colleagues in the, in the briefing room i believe that uh, even those who are uh, very passionate supporters of donald trump uh, they have a certain level of respect for me because they say you're never personal you i i talk about issues but that's again political scientist in me uh, mm. never allow yourself to be personal and uh, going back to Serbia, I'm not optimistic about uh, the leadership of Serbia right now. I'm not, because it puts my generation in a very difficult position where I'm asking myself, what was it all for? Oof. What was it all for? I don't know, but this is why I don't live in Serbia anymore. This is why I made America to be my home because this is the country that I love. This is the country where I can make, you know, my future, my family in. And, you know, I feel like I did the hard work for, for my future children. Because in this country, even if you were born here, you need to remember that there was always someone in your family line who came here and he did or they did the hard work. So you can live the life you're living today. And that is why I, I feel so strongly against the political project uh, Donald Trump is proposing for this nation, especially in the context of the immigrant population. Because people come to this country to live free. That's the bottom line. Even the dreamers, the family of the dreamers, these, fam these families came to this country in order to, to give the future to these children. And we, we must not forget it. And this is why it's kind of my mission right now to go and talk and to inspire all of you to be active citizens and to write and engage and talk and... Uh, argue for the freedom because we need to defend humanity that's how i feel we're here and then we'll go over there. Yeah. Um, so my uh my roommate's actually an international student from belgrade oh, nice. um and both of my parents came to america after um being in the tiananmen protests in beijing um, also kind of about free speech, and so that's why they're here. So I was just wondering um, how important you think it is to have that kind of either immigrant voice or um, voice of someone who's gone through hardship in journalism or in the media that's produced, and how important that is as far as um, how it shapes the way you look at issues or discuss issues um, and what it means for, I guess, the media that you produce. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's extremely important. First, survival skills are important for any profession you want to go into. But I am well aware of the platform I have been given. And I hold responsibility as to how I use my platform today. Uh, as an immigrant, as a woman, uh, I broke the glass ceiling for many immigrants. And that is why I feel it's very important that I speak on their behalf. Because remember, I came to America first to Yale University, which is already a great privilege. And at the time when I came to America, it was already my free choice. That was not a necessity. I could live in Madrid. I could live at that time in London. I went to London School of Economics. I was already established enough that I can make a choice as to where I want to go in life and where I want to work and, and live. 
and but I have chosen this country and that speaks volumes about the immigrant experience and the American identity design and in that sense I take my role seriously and um, I want to help immigrants who are just now hoping to that maybe one day they're going to be able to come here that they look at my experience and they say yes I, I can do the same she did it from Serbia I didn't do it from England or from Canada or uh, some uh, some cool place uh, peaceful place at least from Switzerland I did it from this uh, you know country the president is referring to I'm not going to use the, the word but you know what I mean so I may be the example how someone from the this type of whole country right uh, can come to this country and still uh, uphold the values of, of, of this uh, of this society and I think that's extremely important that we once you're given the platform that you use it for good cause yeah. um, I want to return to Trump for a moment I think it would be possible to give Trump credit for writing two strategies one is nationalism or more particularly white nationalism and another is authoritarianism in other words you might say he's on the right side of history in that there's an impulse toward nationalism, a tribal impulse that we, many, maybe all of us have towards nationalism. And in the modern world, the most successful economies appear to be authoritarian. If you look at China, Singapore, etc., these authoritarian societies are actually outperforming democracies. So is Donald Trump on the right side of history? No. He, he's 100% on the wrong side of the history. And I, I'm sure that many nationalists who started many wars and, and who, who triggered uh, human atrocities, uh, they also thought that they were on the right side of the history. I think that nationalism as a concept is absolutely outdated concept. And I will tell you why. Because I changed so many passports, even in former Yugoslavia, and I never left the country. <laughs> I was Yugoslav, I was then Serbian and Montenegrin, and then I was Serbian, and I lived in Belgrade. <laughs> it didn't change. So for me, um, I believe that sometimes this concept of national na nationalism is nothing but a fifth stamp Fifth, stamp, fifth column in the passport. It doesn't really mean anything. And that's why I, I believe American design is very successful because it's all inclusive and in all, uh, encompassing of all of us. You can be Greek American, you can be uh, Spanish American because it connects the uni universal values of identity. Anyone can be American. You can have an accent and be an American, right? Uh, so I, I don't like nationalism because I, I watched what was going on in terms of the economic argument, the argument of economy, but what's wrong with U.S. economy? And Donald Trump made his fortune in the U.S. within this economic climate. So for him to advocate that we should to do it like China, I'm just confused. <laughs> Other questions? Let me ask you to look forward. We'll close with this. Uh, project yourself 10 years hence, 20 years hence. Where do you see the, the pathway forward taking you? Where do you want to go? Because I've been very, I'm asked this question because I'm sure you have an answer to this, because you're, you strike me as someone who, who uh, sets goals and brings those goals into effect. That's, uh, I think that's, uh, that's something that marks your life on several levels. So, I'm intuition also. Yeah. I, I, I believe that I'm very intuitive in a sense that mm. sometimes I do not have a clear goal, mm. but my intuition that I lean onto 
takes me to that goal. Mm. There I see myself, honestly, I want, I'm dealing with other questions in life right now in a sense of who I am as a human being. So mm -hmm. if I want to project myself in 20 years from now, I just want to be at peace with my mm -hmm. life decisions that I travel mm -hmm. the right path. Mm -hmm. That is something that's very important to me that I can look myself in the mirror and know that mm -hmm. I did not cave in when maybe there was a pressure for me to cave in. Mm -hmm. That I honor my life journey and who I am as a, as a person, as an intellectual, and that I always am in a place where I act responsibly mm -hmm. because I feel that my life journey was, yes, driven by my ambition and desire, of course, but there was also, I believe, some um, divine design mm -hmm. in it, mm -hmm. if you will, because it doesn't happen so often. So I believe that I hold responsibility to all these people I met in my life mm. and I worked with and even to this community at Yale University because it's so rare uh, for anyone who comes from Serbia to achieve these intellectual heights. Mm. So I want to be always, um, whatever I, I become in, in the next 20 years, mm. I want to have this sense of um, knowing that I didn't disappoint all these people. Mm -hmm. So whether I'm going to be in politics or whether I'm going to, you know, keep expanding my um, my journalism and my media. Um, but one 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 thing I know for sure is that I'm going to write books. Okay. Yeah. Well, we I want to thank you for your accountability, your sense of accountability and responsibility and the way that you hold accountable all of us, including our, our government, in the work that you do. So thank, thank you very much. Will you join me? In thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure.